Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Foundations. And the fact that the authorship of the scriptures is divine, in that nobody could contrive all of this. Mm. It's so complex, it's so interwoven, and so detailed, it, it, it's not possible for this book to be of human origin. Foundations. Understanding the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. With Robbo Robinson and Mandy Warby. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi and he taught his disciples along the same principles and patterns of other rabbis. The difference being that uh, Jesus was one that had authority and he had a radical nature of what and how he taught. But the patterns and methods he used were common and known as stringing pearls. So Mandy, what does stringing pearls actually mean? It's actually an unusual term because, again, as we've you know talked about before, pearls come from something that's unkosher, mm. comes from an unclean shellfish, and yet the pearl itself is very, very um, valuable. So when it's talking about stringing pearls, it's, it's, it's talking about putting together things of great value, great meaning, great worth. And with regard to the um, the patterns or the methods of rabbis and sages and, and teachers of the scriptures, they had various different methods of doing that. One of the ones that I always find really fascinating and I really like to watch is when they debate and they argue. They're, they're very passionate. It's fantastic. <laughs> and then they, you know, they shake hands and embrace each other, go home and then come back again and do it all the next day. It's really good. <laughs> but one of the methods is called stringing pearls, okay, or... It's called Gezerah Shiva, or a comparison of equals is what that means. And it basically means that it's a passage of Scripture that you take and it can expand on another passage of Scripture if it shares the same word. So in other words, Scripture is in, interpret Scripture. And you will have probably heard Dr. Chuck Missler refer to this as being called expositional constancy. So when a word or a phrase is used in one place, it means the same thing elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So this was part of the study practice of rabbis where they would, you know, look for places in the Bible where same words were used to see if and how they might be connected so that they could understand better. That was the whole point of this. It wasn't just about what the Word of God said, but what it means, and then to dig even deeper to really get an, a good mm. understanding. And then what happens that helps you to, if, if you learn what it means in one place, that automatically helps you figure out and understand what it means in another place. But, of course, when you do this, the rules of engagement are that it's only applicable if one of the words doesn't undermine the obvious meaning of the written text. Mm. So, Because God will never undermine or contradict his word. Yeah. And they always do this using the Hebrew language because once you move away from the original Hebrew language, it can start to lose some of mm. its meaning, as we, you know, we, we all know. And you can see this actually in the parables in the New Covenant as a good example, like the parable of the sower. Okay, If you read about the, uh, the parable of the sower, you discover that the birds that are mentioned in that parable uh, represent Satan and his workers who snatch away the word. Okay, So in that parable, they're baddies. In Mark, the disciples, Mark 4, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, can you explain the parable to us, please? And he said, don't you understand this parable? How are you going to understand all the parables? In other words... The pattern in this particular parable, and what it means is, is mm. it's going to help you understand all the others. So a bird in one is the same as a bird in another. Precisely. So then if you learn about the parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed in which all the birds came and nested in its branches. Well, if the birds are the messengers of Satan, mm. then the kingdom of heaven is filled with a lot of baddies. Mm. Okay, that's not normally how we read it. But according to expositional constancy or gezerah shiva or comparison of equals, that's how we are to understand the scripture. So that yeah. means you scratch your head and you go, I've got to go back and study these parables. It and also gives you a reason to want to slap the disciples a few times because there was times where Jesus says, do you understand? And they went, yes. Yeah, and you want to go, didn't. no. <laughs> <laughs> Please, get into it and explain that, that oh, one as well. You do, you want to go, guys, my goodness. And you knew but straight away they didn't understand. Yeah. They were just didn't want to say so, <laughs> didn't want to be stupid. You feel like saying, but you were. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so then um, there's other places as well. Okay, um, if you uh, jump forward to the place where uh, Jesus was asked by a young Pharisee, which is the greatest commandment, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, and that's Shema, and we spent a lot mm. of time discussing Shema. Well, those two particular passages 
come from two different places, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and then also Leviticus 19. And because the words in there are the same, those two particular passages have always been connected mm. for century upon century upon century yeah. because they're connected and they reinforce one another. So then jump into the New Testament and the, that, that teacher comes along and says, what about it? And Jesus himself puts those passages together just yeah. like all the rabbis have. That's stringing pearls. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to get to one that's actually really, really interesting where God strings pearls together himself. Okay, Matthew three sixteen to 17. This was the baptism of Jesus, and he comes out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting upon him, and behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. God was quoting his own scriptures and putting these phrases together, okay? So you are my son, comes from Psalm 2, verse 7. It says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's where that comes from. Whom I love comes from Genesis 22, 2. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains that I will tell you. And I might add, that's the first place that love is mentioned in the Bible too, Mm. just quietly. Then, in whom I am well pleased comes from Isaiah 42, where it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights, which means the same thing. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nation. So in both Psalm 2 and Isaiah 42, they've always been understood and accepted as being messianic, talking about the Messiah. In Psalm 2, God is proclaiming him his son, which is royal, his royalty, and to rule over the world. Isaiah 42, this is God saying the Messiah is a servant, and he's going to place his spirit upon him. So Jesus comes up out of the water. God the Father says, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. And then the Spirit descended on him as a dove. Mm. So you see. Yeah, clink, clink, clink. There's three pearls. Exactly. And and you get this. And so does does any of those particular fulfillments or separately undermine or contradict or weaken the original passages in the context that they came from? No, not at all. No. But they're all confirmed. They're all brought together. And you see this picture of Messiah in the New Testament, a fulfillment of all of these. Remember who were, I mean, Isaac, he was the son of promise mm. who was to be sacrificed and God saved ultimately. But when God said to um, Abraham, take your son, sacrifice him for me, and Abraham Knowing that God would keep his promise, said, I'll do what you say. I will not withhold my son. And God says, you won't withhold your son. I won't withhold yeah, my son. that's right. And you you know, the pictures of these, when you put all these together, it's kind of, you know, I think I've heard Chuck Messler describe it this way. It's like somebody takes the top of your head off and drops a grenade in yeah, there and it right. kind of goes kaboom. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. And again, you see this orchestration of the Holy Spirit. And the fact that the authorship of the scriptures is divine, in that nobody could contrive all of this. Mm. It's so complex, it's so interwoven, and so detailed. It's not possible for this book to be of human origin. And I guess keeping in mind that uh, these three passages were written hundreds, if not a thousand years apart. Absolutely. So there's yet separate authors, separate contexts, separate everything, but God ultimately is the author of it all. And then, of course, you're talking about thousands of years before their fulfillment. Mm. It pulls them all together. But this is the power of the Word of God, and we have to understand that the Word of God is without parallel. It's the very foundation of our lives. It's the absolute bedrock of authority. It is... The very thing that keeps us st- – the world is changing. Our society is fluctuating and it's blowing here, there and everywhere, but this isn't. Mm. And I would encourage you to read 2 Peter one three. It says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them – You may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. If we want to be like him, if we want to understand him, if we want to live the faith that he has given us, 
You have to know what his word says. But it also means taking a little shovel and having good dig down deep to find out what it means and pull it all together and then see what God does. Well, there we go. That's what uh, stringing pearls is all about. It's a uh, very rich and certainly nothing to do with making jewellery. Next time we're going to ask the question, what's so wrong with mixing wool and linen? This has been Foundations, a look at the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. For study notes, resources and more, see vision.org.au slash foundations. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.